So, um, first I would also like to thank the organizers and also their wonderful staff. They even gave me some beers last night, so I hope that won't affect my story too much. Um, but they are really friendly. And um, I'm also um, really grateful for being here and being invited, because everyone keeps calling me professor, but I'm really not. I just finished, finished my PhD uh, last week, on Friday the 13th, but everything went well, so that's okay. Um, so I'll um, be talking about what I did. Uh, uh, and the title of my talk is Good Vibrations Emerging, Emerging from Evolutionary Simulations. And uh, evolutionary simulations are really at the heart of what I did, and I'll get to the good vibrations. Um, first, I'll give a quick overview. Uh, so I'll start by explaining what I mean with evolutionary simulations, because it's sort of uh, different from the normal approach that people take for um, studying the human brain and behavior and emotions. Um, so after that, I'll talk about some early work that I did. It's been some time ago, but it was very um, appropriate for this occasion because uh, um, I studied uh, the work of uh, Joe Ledoux. Um, but this was uh, work that I did as a student, and it was published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience in 2003. And then um, years later, I returned to the evolutionary simulations, and um, uh, we uh, found a surprise. We had a surprise finding of oscillations. And I will try and convince you that uh, they have something to do with uh, flexibility in behavior and attention. And um, also that they have something to do with uh, positive effect, or at least effective processing. And um, then I will uh, close by um, describing a, a recent experiment that we did, and it's still in preparation, um, uh, about uh, wh where we tried to test the hypothesis uh, empirically that um, uh, was produced, that was the result of the evolutionary simulations. So, um, first, about the evolutionary process that we simulate. We don't uh, study the, our, our true evolutionary history, but we study the evolutionary process, and we try and, and mimic the process, and we study general abstract mechanisms that can evolve during evolution. So for instance, um, the eye has evolved several times in evolutionary history, and it also in evolutionary simulations, by the way. Um, so we try and um, um, uh, research evolutionary justifications for neural models. Um, and sometimes, because uh, the, evil, the simulations that we use are sort of uh, have random mutations and everything, the models can even, um, the, the, we can even find evolutionary justifications for models that have not beforehand been thought of. So, um, so that's what we had with the oscillations. So what we do is um, we have a really uh, simple, abstract virtual environment, and we create a population of agents and the agents are controlled by neural networks, and we uh, test their performance one by one in the virtual environment, and they have to collect food while at the same time avoiding predators. And the behavior is controlled by their neural networks. But the configuration of their neural networks depends on uh, their genes. And then in the beginning, there are no connections and um, there, there are no weights and they all do really bad. But then um, random mutations occur and some of, some of them start doing a little better. At least better than their siblings. And um, those that do a little better, so that accidentally run into plants a little more often than others and uh, avoid predators a little longer than others, those have a higher chance of, reprodu of reproduction so they have more offspring, and they pass on their genes to the offspring. But, so, and, um, so the offspring is based on the parents, but there's again, there's uh, some small mutations and, and um, recombinations of the genes. So there's variation in the offspring. And again, some offspring will do a little better than other offspring, and, and the ones that do a little better, again, have a higher chance of reproduction. So um, they will pass on the favorable 
properties of the network, of the genes resulting in better networks. And um, in the end, uh, well, I can show you that in the beginning, after 100 generations, there's some, <coughs> some behavior that the, the, the agent moves towards the plant. What you, what you see is um, we put it into the environment until it uh, comes in contact with a predator that is a red dot. And uh, then we, text, we, we take the next one, we put it in, we measure its performance. And the performance is a measure of, uh, so of how many plants it ate, it came into contact with, and how long it managed to evade the predators. So it's really very abstract and very simple. Um, but you can see that there's a, a difference after uh, 10,000 generations, and that this one is really better. It still is not, it's not really perfect, but it does a whole lot better than the one after 100 generations. So um, with this, we initially, um, we uh, studied uh, the evolutionary reasoning by Ledoux. He showed sort of the similar picture like this last night. His hiker was in the woods, and mine is in an open field. But still, uh, there's uh, something that could be a snake or it could be a stick. And the emotional stimuli go in um, to the sensory thalamus. Then there's a direct route to the amygdala. And there's also an indirect route going through the visual cortex to the amygdala. And once the amygdala is stimulated, uh, there's uh, the fear response, or maybe I should say defense response nowadays, apparently. Um, So this um, mechanism um, was found by Ledoux, but he speculated that the evolutionary cost that this, that this system um, is there because the evolutionary cost of a, of a miss exceeds the sum of the costs of the many false alarms. Um, but that's speculation, of course. There were other views at the time, well, there still are probably, of people that said, well, the direct route is just because it, um, it had formed earlier in evolution, the visual cortex wasn't there, and then later on there were all those other connections evolved, uh, that evolved, and um, things got more complex, and uh, the, the direct connection is just um, old uh, redundant stuff, and it's not really important. Um, so well, that's what we um, tried to uh, investigate, and uh, what we did was, oh, that's the wrong way around, what we did was um, we uh, took a very simple network as sort of a, um, a, a possible design. So in the beginning, there are no connections. But the network can, the agents can evolve connections along these routes. So it can evolve uh, connections directly from the input layer to the output layer, but also indirect connections from the input layer to the hidden layer to the output layer. Um, so, and of course, the, the, uh, the agent sensors feed into the input layer, and the, output, the, the activation of the output layer determines its behavior. Um, and it's really the weight of the networks that evolve. So, what happens over time, over many generations, is that if you measure the fitness, that is the, their ability to collect food and avoid predators, it increases over time, and um, uh, over generations, and they get better and better. And then if you analyze the networks at the end of this evolutionary process, then what you find is that it does exactly as uh, Ledoux would predict under certain conditions. Um, namely, that if you do artificial lesion studies, which is of course more easy in, in artificial agents than in, than in real animals, um, <laughs> If you do an artificial lesion study, then, you, then what you see is that with the network intact, what you see is that if we measure the response of the agents to a stimulus, so um, we, would, um, we would put the, uh, the agent in the environment and put a plan to it on uh, 45 degrees on its left, and we would measure the angular speed as a result from the stimulus. So the, the response is the angular speed. If the angular speed is negative, it, it turns away from the stimulus, if the response is positive, it turns towards the stimulus. I, I colored them uh, green and red, so that's easy. You can see that if the network is intact, and initially, they all turn away from the stimulus. 
a little faster for plants than for predators, but that's because for predators it's really important to, um, to move fast and the, and the direction is less important than the speed. So, um, so the angular speed is a little less, but it doesn't really matter. What is, what is important is that the initial response is a fear response or defense response. And then uh, after uh, the second time step, the information comes in through the indirect route and after, <coughs> after the, the indirect processing, the, the response for plants is reversed and it will turn toward the plant. Now if we lesion the network and we cut out the indirect route, then what you see is that the, the, here, the agent will always turn away from plants. And if we lesion the direct route and the network only, can only um, create a response using the indirect route, you see that the response is always appropriate. It all, the agent always turns toward, toward the food and away from the predator, but the response is generated later, so it takes more time. Um, so this is exactly as uh, um, Ledoux predicted. There were uh, a few side notes, and that is that, that we could evolve a system like this by itself but it only would evolve uh, under three conditions. The first is that it has to be difficult to make a distinguish, dis distinguishment between plants and predators. Of course, if it's really easy to separate plants from predators, then you don't need the indirect route. You can, you can just um, only use the direct route, and the response is always correct. So what we did is um, the agents do not directly perceive the food and the predators, but what they perceive is smells that are emitted by the food and the predators, but the, the plants don't have a plant smell and the predators don't have a predator smell, but they have the same smells but in different mixtures. And those mixtures are hard to distinguish. But it helps to have extra, extra nodes in the network. Um, so that was the first condition. The second condition is that um, the indirect route takes more time. Of course, from an, if you use neural networks from, for engineering purposes, you want the network to do really well under all circumstances, and you don't build in a time delay. But for us, uh, the time delay in the processing was essential for um, the spontaneous emergence of, of a system like this. So the processing through the indirect route takes longer than the processing through the direct route. Um, we also did simulations where there was no time delay, no time processing, and then a system that like this would not emerge. Interestingly, there was a third uh, condition, and that was that in the fitness function, the predator had to have a high priority. If food had a high priority, it could also turn around. The initial response could also be positive. So, um, in a general system like this, uh, it's interesting that it can also uh, work the other way around. And maybe in some animals it does. We don't know. For, you, you, to, give an, to illustrate it, you may think of um, a mosquito, for which a meal is really important. It only needs one. If it has one meal, then it can procreate, and that's enough. And for a meal, for, 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 a, for, a, for a mosquito, it may be more uh, rewarding to take a chance. So, um, but in um, all the fear studies that have been done, the direct route really uh, codes for, um, uh, for fear, well, for fear studies, of course. So, <laughs> um, so this is what we found. Um, and it was, uh, I, we thought it was um, uh, nice because we could really um, use this approach for studying the evolutionary justifications of the model. And it really supported the, the, just, the justifications. So we thought maybe we can uh, um, do something more and study um, uh, and, and see if a sort of uh, um, uh, working memory capacity would evolve. So we added uh, the possibility of a context layer and this would be interesting because then um, the, ag the agents could not only respond directly to what it perceived, but it could maybe maintain something it had perceived. So for instance, if it had perceived a predator or something scary, then um, it may enter an 
a state of anxiety and, um, and behave differently from when it was uh, foraging and did not perceive any pressures, for instance. Or something else that may remember landmarks in the environment. We, we, we had all those things that we, could, that we imagined we could be doing, but we never got to that, and I will explain why. Um, but that was the initial uh, goal of this um, augmentation. So the network was um, uh, augmented with a recurrently connected context layer. And we first did a control simulation where we replicated the earlier findings and, um, and indeed uh, uh, a dual processing uh, came out with the same properties as that I described earlier. Um, and, um, but, but now, as you can see, the simulation ran for 10,000 generations instead of 1,000 because we have more connections, so we thought, well, it's more complex, and if we wanted to, uh, to um, uh, give it a good chance of um, avoiding local optimum in the fitness function, then uh, it may be necessary for having more generations. So we ran a couple of simulations, and these take some time. 10,000 generations take about 12 hours. So I came to, my, to work, and uh, the simulations had been running at night, and I came back, and I found this. Um, we ran the simulation, so the control simulation is without the extra layer, and uh, we added the extra layer, and suddenly a miracle occurred. <laughs> Somehow, uh, the agents had become much better in collecting food while avoiding predators. And to us, this was really uh, a surprise, because remember, there was still the time cost of, uh, of the neural processing. So more connections means more time. And, uh, and so for information to flow from, from the input layer to the hidden layer to the new context layer, back to the hidden layer to the output layer, it takes a long, takes a long time. And um, we had expected the context layer really to be adaptive in a more complex environment or other factors should maybe play a role. But in this simple setup, it was uh, really a surprise. So what happened? Well, we found that sort of a, a flip-flop mechanism had evolved. The hidden layer, nodes in the hidden layer would be activated, and uh, they would activate nodes in the context layer, and then these nodes in the context layer would inhibit the sending nodes of the hidden layer. So these would be um, inhibited. But then if these were inhibited, the nodes from the context layer were no longer active because they weren't activated. And then the nodes of, in the hidden layer could become active again. And so intermittently, they would be active, not active, active, not active, and they started oscillating. And um, that's what you see in the graphs on the right, is the activation of the nodes. And so in the, in the output neurons, there's also uh, uh, the oscillating activation. So but why would these oscillations produce agent, agents that are so much better in collecting food and avoiding predators? So we did a lot of te tests with these agents and had them doing tasks. And we found that um, actually the oscillating agents were much more flexible in their behavior. There's sort of a competition going on between they either have to, if they, if they perceive a stimulus, and remember, they're hard to distinguish. If they perceive a stimulus, then um, they can either uh, avoid it or approach it. And there's a competition going on in the behavior that it chooses. So but if every other time step, the, net, the nodes in the network are deactivated, and then they become active, active again, and then if there's new input, if there's new information, then um, the competitive process is immediately reset and a new outcome can be created much easier. So, um, um, no, so, yeah, so this is what I said. Agents with oscillating networks eat more plants and evade predators longer. And um, yeah, so what they do is they respond with amplified turns. They turn faster and they accelerate faster. And it's really because they switch resp their response faster. 
Um, so, if this is true, if uh, uh, the oscillations are uh, so adaptive because they help to switch, then would, it, uh, would the valence of the stimulus influence the oscillation frequency? Of course, we repeated the, the, initial the, the initial simulation a couple of times, and we found that oscillations could occur at different frequencies. They could occur faster or slower, and so if they were faster, then nodes would be active, 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 and then not active, not active, not active. So it would, they would take more time steps to, um, to oscillate. And um, we thought, the, will, the, will the valence influence how fast these networks are oscillating? So we repeated uh, the simulation uh, 25 times, and in total, I think in total we had 32 simulations, and we analyzed the networks of all the last generations, and um, first we tested whether uh, the oscillations were really um, always uh, producing higher fitness, that is, um, better skills in collecting food and avoiding predators, and uh, indeed we found non-oscillatory non networks is not a guarantee in the evolutionary process, of course, that this will evolve. So in some simulations, there were some agents without oscillatory networks. But those that did not have oscillatory networks had significantly low, a low, lower fitness than agents with oscillatory networks. And um, then we tested the, their response, the response uh, um, with the different stimuli, so we place them again, we place them in an empty world with just one stimulus, either a plant or a predator, and we found that uh, in response to a plant, the networks would oscillate much faster than in response to a predator. Well, um, this made a lot of sense, because if you're fleeing from a predator, then it's not always handy to be flexible and to switch your behavior. You should be fleeing and nothing else. On the other hand, if you're foraging and you're, you're collecting food and, 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 and you're searching for food all the time and suddenly you detect a predator, then it is much more important to be able to switch fast. So this um, really confirmed our idea that uh, the flexibility increased, um, uh, was increased by the oscillations and uh, that um, the flexibility was greater, the oscillations was greater with a positive stimuli, more, posi with more, more flexible with positive stimuli than with negative. So, um, oh. so we concluded that oscillations have a higher frequency in an appetitive state associated with positive effect than in an aversive state associated with negative effect. So um, Paul just talked a bit about uh, effect and attention. And um, I uh, have a background in artificial intelligence, and I didn't know. But apparently, there is a lot of research about, well, not that much, but about um, behavioral flexibility and attention and effect. And um, it was interesting that, uh, that um, what Paul said was actually a bit of the opposite of what I'm going to say. But what I'm going to say, <laughs> saw five minutes ago. Now, it was, uh, I have this quote from 1994, so that's a long, that's a long time ago, where Tucker and Derry Derryberry say that negative emotional states serve to narrow people's attention to focus, and positive emotions lead to an opposite effect, an expansion of attention to focus. Well, of course, this is a really a, a, gen a, a broad generalization of um, where I uh, make a distinction between negative emotions and positive emotions. In reality, it... Um, there are nuances and, uh, and, and there's a, a big distinction between fear and anger, although they're, normally they're both seen as negative emotions, but they behave very different. But um, in general, um, uh, attention is influenced by, uh, and attention flexibility is influenced by emotions, and that's the most important thing. Uh, so you can also find this in, in task switching studies where people find it easier to switch tasks when they are in a good mood and uh, they are more easily distracted by, by distractors when they are doing a task when they are in a good mood. Um, so but my, point, my point would be that this attentional flexibility would, color, would, would, would correlate with um, oscillation frequency. So I would say 
I would predict that there are faster oscillations with, uh, with a greater cognitive flexibility. Um, so uh, I looked more in the literature to see if there was any, anything was, um, was, was known about, this, um, uh, about the relation between effect and oscillations. And uh, there really wasn't. So, but there's, there, there are things that are, there are studies that have been done with attention and effect and also attention and oscillations. And uh, here, also here there's controversy um, about the, the, the role of oscillations with attention, mostly what band and what circumstances and what frequency band. So, um, but, but there are lots of people and, and, and there's controversy, but there's, there's sort of a consensus that gamma oscillations, oscillations in the gamma band um, from ranging from 30 to 70 hertz most of the time in most, in most literature sometimes it's even greater, um, that um, oscillations in this, in this frequency band are associated with attention. And um, I'll uh, illustrate this by um, uh, a very simple experiment by Bauer et al. He um, uh, would show a, a, a screen flicker, so a contrast flicker on, on the screen of a, of a computer screen, and um, other studies had found that neurons in the visual cortex can phase lock with a contrast fl flicker. So what you do is you, you, show, you, you rapidly show dark gray and light gray and, um, uh, in, a stimulus, in a stimulus strain, and you, you, you mix those and, um, or in, a, in a flicker, and then you measure the oscillation frequencies of uh, neurons in the, in the visual cortex, and you find that, they, that there are neurons that start oscillating with the same frequency as, as the screen flicker. So um, what he did, what Bauer did, was he said, well, if this um, represents attention, or if this has anything to do with attention, then um, I might be able to, to trigger attentional focus by showing a screen flicker. But what he did was he made the screen flicker invisible. That is, the contrast was so small that subjects would not um, consciously perceive the screen flicker. He, it's uh, easy to test afterwards, of course. He would, uh, he would have one of those locations. Uh, at one of those locations, he would, script, he would flicker the screen. And then afterwards, he would, he would uh, have a, a, a block where he would ask, where do you guess the screen flicker is? And then they would always guess a chance level. Um, so they're not con consciously perceiving the screen flicker. Um, so what he found was that a gamma flicker can trigger attentional selection without awareness. So if you, uh, so this, in, in this, um, uh, the people have to select the target, and in this example, this is the target because it's deviating from these two uh, contrasts. And um, uh, so now if you uh, prime the screen with a flicker here, then people will be able to respond to it faster than when you provide them with a flicker on either uh, these two locations. Um, so that's what you see here, but, it only, but especially when the flicker is at 50 hertz in the gamma range. This, uh, the, the light gray bar here is the reaction time uh, in response to an ingruent prime, so then the, the screen was flickered, for instance, here. And the uh, black bar is in the congruent condition where the target was primed. So the idea is that, that during the prime, people un un unconsciously move their attention from the cross here towards the target. And then when they see the target, they're faster to recognize it as a target. And, um, but they, so what they said was, we find that a subliminal 50 hertz flicker at a target location before target presentation speeds up and enhances target detection and discrimination. Um, so but effect and oscillations, um, we found there was really nothing there. If anyone knows of a, of, of a study that might be interesting in, um, uh, or reveal something about this um, uh, relationship, I would really like to hear about it. I found two that provided clues. Uh, the first one was uh, a study with cats of uh, Roquel, Busset and Busset from 1998. It doesn't really say anything about effect, 
But what, it did, what, it, what they found in their experiment was that um, oscillations, in their opinion, um, provided the cat with flexibility because what they did was um, they uh, had a cat and they measured the oscillation frequencies in the premotor cortex in two conditions. And in the, one, in the first condition, the cat would be observing a mouse in a glass box. So the cat could see the mouse and, and, and it knew that it was there, but it also knew that it could not reach the mouse because, well, it was behind a glass wall. So the cat would be waiting, but there was really nothing to do. But then they took the mouse out of the box and put it in a small hole in the wall, and then the, the cat couldn't see the mouse anymore, but it knew that it was there, and if it would just wait, and probably it would come out. So the cat would sit next to the hole, ready to strike, and in that condition, the oscillations, um, the oscillation frequent frequency um, rose enormously, and what they said was development of 40, 40, hertz, 40 hertz rhythms is related to waiting intensely for a stimulus to occur. So the behavioral situation is sort of a transition between a kind of passive waiting and a more active preparation or readiness for action. Okay, so you can see in their wording that this is sort of um, fake and uh, they're not really sure of themselves, but it's a sort of a, um, new ground here. So, um, but it's interesting. Then another study from 2009 also provided a clue. Now this is a bit complex, but luckily, um, Joe talked about it last night. This is from uh, the Dicerod groups in the group, and they um, used an optogenetic method where they um, tried to uh, uh, try to see if there was a difference between um, a tonic release of dopamine and, uh, and a phasic release of dopamine. So um, what they did was um, uh, they, um, uh, they had, they had mouse in two conditions. In one condition, they would, um, they, they would have the, uh, so in, Joe, Joe told it yesterday, but I will maybe briefly say it again. These mouse were, were transgenic mouse, they were, um, they had uh, uh, altered genes in their ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area is associated with reward. And um, um, with this optogenetic method, they could control the exact moment of firing of the dopamine, dopaminergic neurons. So um, what they did was um, they stimulated the, the dopaminer dopaminergic neurons at 50 hertz or at 1 hertz. So at 1 hertz is much slower, but then this stimulation would last 50 times longer. So the same amount of dopamine, well, we don't know if the same amount of dopamine was released, but they had the same amount of stimulation. Um, so, and then in one condition, the, 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 the mice would be stimulated with 50 hertz, and in another condition, and it was in, physically in, an, in another room, they would be exposed to 1 hertz stimulation. And um, on the third day, so this was the, the, the first condition was in, on day one, the second condition was on day two, and then the third day, the, 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 mouse would, would, the mice would move freely in uh, the environment, and they would always choose to go to the room where they had been exposed to the 50, to the 50 hertz um, stimulation. So what they concluded was that high, fre high frequency phasic firing in dopaminergic neurons is sufficient for behavioral conditioning. So the mouse, mouse learned to, um, that, that one room was nice or the other room was bad, but in any, in any case, the relationship was that the one room where they had been exposed to the 50 hertz stimulations was better than the other one. So um, I will close with, um, uh, with uh, the preliminary results of an experiment that uh, we did. Um, we replicated the study by Bauer et al, where he induced oscillations in the visual cortex to induce an attentional focus. But according to our hypothesis, um, this could also um, have an effect for the effective evaluation of the stimuli. So what we did was um, we uh, changed the Gabor patches 
for uh, neutral faces, but at the um, and and the task was uh, spot the sex. So we had to lure the students, so we had a nice title for the experiment. And um, what they had to do was they had to uh, they had to select the, the target location. So in this case, it's uh, the male. It could also be two males and one female. And then they had to uh, select whether the, the face gave an overall negative impression or a positive impre impression. So not whether it was pretty or not, but just um, they had to select really fast whether it was a negative impression or a positive impression. And um, they had only really short time for this. So first, at the target location, we could give a screen flicker or not. Th th these were the two conditions. And, um, and then, uh, we would show the three phases, but only for 600 milliseconds. We tried to stay as close to the Bauer experiment uh, as possible, because, well, it was sort of a, I, I, I was really skeptical at first, so I thought we will stay as close to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the first experiment as possible. Um, and what we found was that, indeed, if we, so if we did this, so we, we, we showed a prime, uh, uh, an invisible prime, well, it was not invisible because it uh, responds, but the subliminal prime. They were not aware of this prime. And we showed it to the participants for only 400 milliseconds, and then we showed the three phases, and then we found that indeed the gamma flicker would increase the positive ratings. That is, um, we measured it implicitly, but we also measured it explicitly, and um, we found that explicitly, um, without the prime, the participants would rate the phases the target faces for 48% positive, but with the prime, for only 400 milliseconds, the ratings would go up from 48% to 55.5%. So, um, well, we were shocked by the effect size here, and um, I would like to conclude by um, saying that uh, I hope to have convinced you that, that evolutionary simulations can produce well, can, can investigate hypotheses, but also produce new hypotheses, and that the effect gamma hypothesis um, is, that was produced by these simulations that predicts that positive effect is coded for by high frequency oscillations in the gamma range. Now, well, of course, this is just really <coughs> a new ID, and it's really the, maybe the beginning of an ID, and there's so many questions that are, still have to be researched, but the, um, for now, this is the hypothesis, and it's really nice that it was confirmed, supported by the study that we did with the faces. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much, and, and I will open uh, for questions. Uh, any questions? For either speaker, actually. Uh, yes, Joe? Could you, um, do you have anatomical uh, speculations about the context layer? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, it's really, it's really abstract, so it's really difficult to, to try and say something about, um, about the, the, the real brain structures and, and anatomical structures, but um, the work that we tried to do was really inspired by um, uh, a paper that, um, a study that argued that working memory, uh, the working memory capacity is derived from a synchrony in oscillations between the, the, the prefrontal eye field in the, in the, in the I'm saying the prefrontal eye field and, um, and, and areas in V4. So oscillations between those two. So, so we, we were inspired by this paper, but I, it's really difficult to, to, to go from, from my really abstract networks right. to real brains, of course. Okay. I have a question for Paul also. Um, towards the beginning of your talk, you emphasized the whites of the eyes, but then at one point you were talking about pupil size, which also will change the whites, right? So it doesn't reduce the amount of white if no, it, it, it'll live. Moved. It'll live within the iris, so it'll. Okay. It, it won't change the, the size of the white. Okay. What um, what we have thought about is that uh. The 
the, the size of the eye-white field itself, that probably might not be the rule because if you just look around the room, there's amazing differences in the size of scleras. Mm -hmm. So if that were the case, we'd all be walking around the world going like this, right? So what I think is it's the, the, that iris is really important because, yeah, sure, when you widen your eyes, there's more white pixels, but some people have really big scleras and, and um, you don't get that same signal. What happens in a fear face uniquely is the top of the iris gets revealed. That is, you can see a white strip over it. So we actually think that that's probably a more important rule than the number of white pixels. So we've been playing with um, Photoshop to come up with stimuli that keep the number of scleral pixels constant, but okay. have the strip or don't have the strip. So when you did the Photoshopping, you adjusted all that. Uh, you didn't just like make the, the pupil bigger. Uh, for the pupil thing, we, uh, we took natural pictures um, half of the stimuli were natural and half the stimuli were photoshopped mm -hmm. and then that was all counterbalanced Everything was within 30 percent because that's within physiological uh, realism. There was still some iris left okay. But if you look at some of these studies yours is a good point. They have pupils that are 180 percent And so they're not biologically uh, possible. So then you're going to get lots of distorted reactions Okay So a question for Paul so we know how eyes are important for the amygdala and the assessment of emotions, but what really drives uh, us to first look into the eyes? I'm, I'm thinking in the context of autism and you know, all related problems. Um, yeah, so the, that's a great question. All right, I told you when you look at, if I have a fixation point at the nose level and I throw a face up, the first thing you're gonna do is go to the eyes. And so the question was, what, what drives that? Fine, amygdala goes once you get there. Turns out it's amygdala. <laughs> Sorry, I'm telling you, it's all you really need to know. Um, those patients, um, uh, SM anyway, uh, the most famous of the patients, um, she can't process fear faces properly. That means when they ask her for a valence rating, it's not high enough. You know, on a scale from one to ten, how afraid does that guy look? She's giving, giving it ones and twos and not eights like we do. Um, on a scale from one to ten, how, how activated or aroused is that guy? She's giving it ones or twos. If on every trial you say to her, okay, here comes a face, look at the eyes. If you do that, she's cured. That is now, she says, eight. So the point is that amygdala is, is really, it, there's, 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 there's nine different amygdalas and, and all these roles it plays, and one of them is attentional orienting or associative orienting. It really, it, in this example, it really goes to the motor circuitry that, that moves you, your eyes up. And the way, I, the way I think about it is what amygdala does in that situation is it says to the sensory organs, you know, think about a rat turning its, its ears one way or, or, a ra or a rabbit moving its pinna to, to where the sound came last time. Orient your sense organs to where you learn best on the last trial because that's our best chance to learn something important on this trial. So it really is part of that same system. So even if it's not emotional at, at this point, because we, you know, it's kind of before detecting any emotions from, from the eyes, yes? Yeah, so I think that's the whole point of that, that, that baseline I was telling you about. I mean, how can you know that something's gonna be important? That's why novelty is important, but it's not novelty per se. It's reactions to novelty in case you find out in retrospect that that was an important predictor, then at least you paid attention to it, right? That's the last question. Thank you both very much. Thank you.